Bipolar activity disorder or ADHD can be complicated and it can last it's like it's a working. long time. Living with the condition can sometimes right. be a challenge. It may take years to accept the final <laughs> diagnosis, and it's not always easy to find the right to do it yourself. Wow. You know I'm trying to go on. I was trying to get the camera to go. With ADHD so. have at least one additional mental health condition that also requires a comprehensive approach to treatment. ADHD guidelines were all the topics pretty straightforward. The need to still the chime in. Associated like, where do you want people to go? The website is going to be okay. Your child's doctor about right, right. proper screening and visit more to ADHD.com for additional information. That's more to ADHD.com. This message has been brought to you in partnership with Ada, ACO, and Chad. This is W. We talk about the upcoming Fed meeting, too, because it's the end of the week. Call radio in Philadelphia. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. WWD in Philadelphia and WBEN HD2, Burlington, Philadelphia. We talk about when I talk like in the microphone. Hello, this is my name. too far away. As a parent, when you're told, this type of news, you're going to do whatever you can do for your babies. When we got to St. Jude is when I realized that, no, you're not going to get a bill for anything. I don't have to worry about it. They're saying we're going to help save her. We're not going to charge you anything. You this is what your we St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Finding cures, saving children. Thirty crooked teeth I mean, that age, you have like a kids double stroll or something. Can't braces. Like and trying to fix their teeth themselves can make yeah, things I worse. Have like the, Luckily, like the there's donated the orthodontic services, a program from the American Association of Orthodontists. For children and teens who qualify, so and are matched with a like, orthodontist, treatment can be so like a on my chair I'm all and I'm help like, them smile <laughs> with confidence. <laughs> Learn more like, at aaxarot.org. Like, <laughs> WWDB Philadelphia. Ready? The Talk Station. <laughs> Good afternoon, Greater Philadelphia area. This is Tool Time Real Estate Radio on WWDB 860 AM. I'm Tom Tool. She's Stacy Mitchell. Sarah Timon's in traffic. No surprise with being close to the Scoople Expressway. And we've got special guests. Evan Roscoe's from FBO Services. He's here for the whole show, financial expert, good friend of mine. And Stacy, Sarah, and I, we all work at the Tom Tool Sales Group at REMAX Mainline, the number one REMAX team in Pennsylvania since 2018. And we're streaming live every week on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram. Just look up Tom Tool Sales Group. So, Evan, first of all, thanks for coming on, man. Evan is a little nervous here. He told me he had anxiety as soon as I asked him to come on the show. Uh, and... We, we even got the stream set up on our own today. I'm, I'm very proud of this. This is like fixing your own you air conditioner. Um, that, somebody did. Awesome. So we, we're, we're live. Hopefully people can give us a comment if we're live on YouTube. So uh, we're going to get all into FBO Services, Inc. at the third segment. They are a family office when it comes to investing in finances and accounting. First, we want to talk about what's been going on in the housing market. And it was a good week for inventory. We've got a Fed meeting looming large here as we get towards the end of the month. So here's the latest national stats. We saw listings week over week rise by 8,815 homes. We saw 30-year rates settle in around 7%. That, that seems to be where they've been trending. We saw like one day last week where they were at 6 and 7 eighths. And purchase applications were at down 1% week to week, I'm pretty encouraged by inventory, Stacy. What's your reaction to all this? Yeah, uh, anytime that there's a bump in the inventory <laughs> is a good week or a good day or whatever. Um, I think it's that's very positive news. Uh, yeah, the mortgage interest rates, um, we kind of feel that they'll be around this area for mm -hmm. at least another couple of months. Um, and the purchase apps being down, I mean, honestly, I think there's a lot of uh, people that are preoccupied right now with vacations. So that's not surprising to me. The people that are very motivated and have to be settled before uh, the start of the school year, they're the ones that are out there still um, driving the market at this point. But there are, you know, I've had a number of clients, uh, you know, go out of town for a couple of weeks or out of country. Uh, people are taking advantage of the summertime break. 
Well, I, I, that, that's very realistic because a lot of folks, and especially most of these agents that are out there, they're not used to this seasonal market that we see every year. And if you look at like the middle of uh, July to about mid-August, I mean, I, I saw someone post on social that school starts in 36 days, which is insane to me. Wow. Uh, and, and, you know, and we're sitting here. Out. <laughs> I, it's a lot shorter. Summer's a lot shorter than, than it used to be. But you have this this serious block of vacations that happen no matter what. We were just talking about it kind of goes like 4th of July up until about like that second, third week in August. And then school starts to go back right before Labor Day. So there are folks out there that are pausing from the market because they have other things going on in their lives. And then typically you see a run up on the market um, heading into the fall. So that doesn't surprise me. The, the, The good news here that I see is we've seen inventory rise. And if you look at just what's happened locally in our market, the past seven days in the bright MLS, which is how we chart everything, we saw 155 coming soon homes come to the market, 403 new actives, and 65 back to actives. So that puts us at about 600 homes over the past seven days. And I'm clear that our market is probably more seasonally affected than some of these other places that are out there because people are going to the beach and they have these destinations around. If you look at the numbers nationally, inventory's up, but if you look at where it was the same week last year, we're not that far off. We've kind of caught up to where we were last July, where the same week last year, July 15th of July 22nd in 2022, we were at 525,000 and change active homes. Right now we're at 479. That gap has been a lot bigger earlier in the year. So we're closing the gap down, which is good for homeowners. And a lot of the I think what happens in the market here, if we're going to see more inventory continue to come, it's going to be based on what happens in the Fed meeting later this week. So what's your predictions for the Fed meeting? What do you think, Stacey? And Evan, if you want to chime in, feel free. Well, I think they're definitely going to raise it another um, 0.25 basis points. So that has already been established. The good news is the Fed is signaling or, you know, it's been announced that the interest rate or the inflation rate was at 3%. They made this Mm -hmm. big announcement, fanfare, confetti. Oh, we're down to 3%. So to me, that signals that the Fed's going to back off after this last uh, raise. So I think after they raise it this next time, the next couple of times they meet, it's going to just be no, no change, no change, no change. And I think at that point, then it will settle some of the fears of the market. It's going to help... you know, people that are entertaining buying a house or selling a house, you know, as long as the interest rates remain steady or decrease, Mm -hmm. there's a possibility they could go down. That would be nice. That would be great. Um, Then I think that's when we're going to really see some inventory come onto the market. Yeah. I mean, I agree. I think that they are going to keep raising to get this inflation under wraps, but, uh, and probably hold cutting down for the year. And I think, you know, with Biden's, you know, presidential elections are going to start to cut to juice this economy. I, that's a really yeah. great point yeah. is that we got an election year coming up. And, uh, you know, the past couple elections have been very hotly contested. I mean, it's it's like no holds barred to get these folks elected. So I don't see the current administration. And this is not a political comment. This is a strategy comment to win, win the election. They're not going to want to be jamming rate hikes mm-hmm. leading up to the leading up to the election. Exactly. That's, that's not what they want to do. So that's a really great point, Evan. Love that. And Stacy, what the, the, the probability, we, we pulled this up, I feel like every week, it's on cmegroup.com. Sarah Time is here, everybody. The show can officially start. Um, so it, it's, they, they, they chart the likelihood that we're going to see a probability of a Fed rate increase. We are at a 98.9% chance they increase by 25 points. And now, for the first time in months, a 1.1% chance it's a 50 basis point increase. Oh. I really hope that that's, that, that, that doesn't happen. But before, when they would chart this, it was like, here's the chance of a 0% rate increase versus here's the chance of a 25 basis uh, point increase. So if I was betting, for all the, I didn't, I, I'm sure you can bet on this somewhere. There's not like a DraftKings oh, app for the, for the Fed rate hikes. I mean, it's got, it's got to be out there. I would bet on the 25 basis point increase. So looking at that, and then uh, you know, we'll let Sarah get settled here and get her take on this. We're still seeing this this widespread on the 10 year versus the where, where the interest rates are coming in because there's all this risk that was associated with that banking crisis with Silicon Valley Bank and these other places. And until we see inflation come down, I think there's still going to be that measured risk there. That's what a lot of experts are, are predicting. Um, 
And we've got a lot more news happening this week besides just the Fed meeting. There's the uh, FHFA house price index and the Case Shiller home price index that's going to come out. We'll get new home sales this week, pending home sales. There, there's, and then we'll have a PCE inflation report on Friday. So there's a lot of stuff that could affect the bond market and how rates uh, continue to move or not move as, as we as we get get through the end of the week here. So it'll be a pretty interesting week when it comes to data, and we'll see how the market reacts. So Sarah, I know you just got here. Inventory's up, rates are holding steady. What are you seeing in the market with your clients right now? How are they reacting to a bump in inventory and some steadiness in rates? Um, positively. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that people are excited to see um, more things continue to come to, to the market. Um, at the same time, though, I think as more things come out, there are some properties that maybe would be a good fit that they're kind of holding off on because they think something better may may come along. So, you know, just trying to look at each each place individually. I think the rates being a bit more stable has been, again, you know, positive. It just makes people feel more comfortable, um, you know, in in the decisions that they're making. So are you feeling the same thing, Stacey? Because it, it seems like that consumers are kind of okay with what's going on right now. And uh, I even had a conversation with someone that you and I have both spoken to today. And they were they, the, the conversation was, hey, we, we'd love to make a move. We got this 3.25% rate. And I don't know that it makes sense to double our, it's not even doubling their costs. It's like doubling or tripling their monthly payment right now to go to a seven. So are, are you seeing a lot of that in the market as well? The people who have the low interest rates and no real motivation to move are the ones that are most likely to stay put. They're how, just going to ride it out. So how do you determine that? Like, how do you determine motivation? Or, or Sarah, feel free to chime in here. What, what do you call a top prospect? Like, what are the characteristics surrounding those folks? Because this is where a lot of real estate agents get stuck. They say, like, people say the right things, but then their actions kind of dictate something differently. Like, they don't communicate with you. They don't do the, the things that they're supposed to do. So how, how do you determine that? And I think it's as important for the consumer to determine if they're really serious about moving. Because a lot of people have these ideas, but they don't necessarily think it all through. So what, how are you guys managing expectations right now, knowing that rates probably could go down later in the year, but they're, they're at 7% now? Yeah, I mean, I would say looking for people that are motivated, meaning they have a reason to make the move, um, whether it's, you know, upsizing or downsizing or, you know, relocating, whatever the, the reason is that there is um, something, some outside pressure that's kind of making them want to make a jump and do something um, and not just stay put where they are. Um, I think also having like finances in place, being like mm -hmm. able to make a purchase <laughs> is certainly That's important. important. <laughs> really important. Um, so I mean, those are like definitely the the top two. And I guess also, you know, people that communicate back with you. They're, you're having, you know, two-way conversations. They get in touch with you and they see something. They respond to you and you send them something. And it's not just crickets. Yeah, I agree. Um, you, you can kind of weed them out very early on in the, in the meeting process. Uh, if somebody tells you, you know, right off the bat, hey, you know, we love our house, you know, we're not, we don't have to move, we would like to, you know, if the opportunity presents itself. Uh, and then you have to drill down a little bit more and exactly what they would be motivated to make that move with. Is it going to be the four or five bedroom home? Um, is it going to be, you know, a different school district? Sometimes that's really important. Mm -hmm. So, and that's how I kind of measure the motivation. It, are they expanding the family? Or do they want to get closer to work? They want to get out of the city and into the burbs to a different school district. Those are pretty solid motivation, you know, motivators right there. Um, but if it's somebody that's been in the house, you know, about 20 years, they refi, they don't really have to move. They would like to, it's kind of, they're toying with the idea. They're the ones, you know, I just, I stay in touch with them. I never lose contact. I keep up, you know, follow up with them on occasion, make sure they're on drips and um, check in with them to see how, how the home search is going. And you can track them. You can see if they're looking around at things. Um, and then on the off chance that their perfect dream home does come up, then, you know, you want to make sure that they're in a position uh, that they can make a move. Yeah, I mean, and it's um, 
this doesn't happen often, but I have had it happen where somebody's like, oh, you know, we're just, we're just looking if the right thing comes up, we really don't have to do anything. And then within a month, they're under contract. So like every once in a while, it does, it does go the other way. Cause I think a lot of times people tend to say like, no, I'm definitely, you know, trying to do this. Um, but their actions don't necessarily line up with that. Mm-hmm. Um, but every once in a while, somebody's like, nope, I, this is going to be long-term. And all of a sudden they're like ready to do it. Most people I find if they're renting, they can move anytime for the most part. Uh, if they, if someone tells me, you know, uh, they say um, we're renting. The next question I would be, oh, di- are you? When does your lease expire? And if they say, oh, we're on month to month, and we can terminate any time with a sixty day notice, then I know they're going to be ready to go if the if the house that they want comes on the market. Uh, it's a lot easier for renters to get out of the lease, um, and they have more motivation than someone who has been locked in and have the three and a half percent interest rate mm-hmm. mortgage, who are kind of, you know dilly-dallying with the idea of moving. Well, and to me, the the, the three and a quarter or 4%, that, that's a condition, right? I mean, unless someone has a, has a serious need to move, they're, they're going to keep that lower cost. I mean, you think of that's, that's the biggest cost that most people have is their housing payment, right? So if you're able to lock that in there, I mean, those are almost like golden handcuffs in a lot of cases if the house works. And so that's, you have to understand that and not push so hard as an agent. And you have to understand that as a consumer. So, so I want to run one thing uh, by you two and, and Evan, feel free to chime in. Think if I want you to tell me if these are viable or not. This was an article that Housing Wire put out there uh, based on the objection. I'd list my home, but where would I move? Because this is what we're talking about here. Um, and th- they put 10 solutions together. I just want to hear true or false, what you guys think being in the market. So the first one is build a home instead of chasing after the scarce resale inventory and they go on to explain that 30% of available homes are new construction. There's advantages to that, obviously. One is that builders will give you a lower fixed rate. On a, and we've seen that a lot. So I think that, that that's a valid point here. Do you think that's a viable option for a lot of people or not? Building a new home versus chasing resale inventory. I mean, it could be an option if they're okay with new construction. But then again, if they're on certain time constraints, it might not work. I know that in our area alone, in some really specific areas, all the new construction we're going into 2024, so mm-hmm. it might not work for them. Uh, and then some people, it just might not fit into their budget because there's not a whole lot of um, certain price points of new construction that are available out there. But um, it really is just case by case, and it depends on where the school districts are too, if somebody's looking for a specific school district. Uh, yeah. the, the other thing about new construction, I'm sorry, yeah. is, you know, I, I talked to some people, well, we're just going to look for some land and we're just going to, you know, buy a piece of land and build. And then I have to really dive in deeper with them. Like, oh, have you done this before? Have you known anybody to do this? Because that's an enormous undertaking. I don't right. think people quite understand the process of that. Mm-hmm. You know, you have to get meet with an, a, an architect, get some plans drawn up, put them before you know, the, the township, get the approvals, get the permits. Do you mm-hmm. have to, you have to park the land? Is it public sewer or public? When you start talking like that, their heads explode. They don't understand. Right. It's almost, it, it sounds like this like super fun, like <laughs> fantasy thing, you know, like, oh, I'm just going to do this. And when you get More down to HGTV, right, right. When you get down to what all goes into it, I would, I'd agree with everything that you said. If you are flexible on time frame, um, I know, for instance, I, just, uh, we're still in July, uh, earlier this month, uh, had a settlement for a new construction that they signed on for last June, mm-hmm. um, with the expectation of it being completed in about four months. And <laughs> we were at Good 13 oh months. Gosh. So, um, I think no, and I guess like also depends on, um, obviously price point is there a new construction that's happening in the area that you're trying to get into. If there is, how far along in that process are they? Have they spoken to the township yet? Have they put in stormwater management? Have they built the temporary road? Because those things can take months. Um, what could be a good option for somebody is if they got in on the tail end of a um, new development that was being built where all those things were in place and that's gonna significantly cut down on your time. Um, but then I guess also making sure they're aware that the price that you see is your base package price. If you're looking at a model with different upgrades, um, you know, different features in it, 
all of those are going to be additional items that get added on that you may or may not, depending on the builder and depending on the setup, be able to just roll into your mortgage payment. They may have to be upgrades that you pay for out of pocket separately. Yeah, and that could really add up quickly. Mm -hmm. Like if you want special lighting or just can lighting in the right. living room. Yeah. <laughs> what type of flooring do you want? Is a carpet okay all the way around or, or do you want hard surface flooring? It really just depends and it can add up quite quickly. Right. And I think I'd agree that I think it makes sense, especially if you have time and budget. Because um, for me, finding a house that has all those things is so hard to do. So, I mean, it's almost like chasing that inventory takes so much time and might not ever work. So, I think it does make sense. Yeah, yeah that's a great point. So, uh, I, I think, you know, for some people it is viable, some it's not. I think that that's the way to look at it. We're going to motor through the next couple of these. Buy first, close, then list previous home. To me, Number one option. If you can do that, that's going to take all the stress out of moving. I don't know what you two think. And, and obviously, you got to be financially capable to do it. You got to have the down money, access to an equity line, and be able to get approved or you're paying cash. This is option one for everybody that's trying to buy and sell, in my, in my view. Mm -hmm. What do you I two agree. think? 100%. Yep. I mean, I think meet with somebody, get the comps, find out what the home that you would eventually be selling would go for so that you can kind of like have the numbers, be conservative with everything. Um, but yeah, if you can do it, that's gonna be the best way to strengthen uh, your offer on the buy side. All right, that one's easy. Here's where the, it gets a little funny. So um, sell first, rent for a while, and then take the time to look for the right home. What do you think about this? I know people that are currently doing that. Um, How's it going for them? Well, yeah, it's they're not happy in their rental. And, it, you know, they have things in storage, so it's costing. And um, they're still not finding what they're looking for. Yeah. So they they found themselves kind of in a quagmire here. Yeah. I mean, I think it would depend on, um, you know, how picky they are with the new house. Like if it has to be on a, a certain street or in a certain neighborhood and it has to have, you know, X, Y, and Z, and they're not willing to like budge on those things while you know, it would, if they do get the right one, it would strengthen their offer that they don't have to have a home sale contingency. Um, they may be, they'd have to be okay potentially looking for a while. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with that. I think it's, you, you don't have as much control, but sometimes you have to sell right. to buy a home. And, and we've had these clients and if you go on with the contingency, I think you're, I think you have a big problem. Yeah. It's just, it's just not buy. I mean, some people accept it. You got, you got one accepted. So it does happen like very recently. All right, here's the next one. Offer acceptance contingent on seller finding suitable housing. And they say give the seller like 90 to 120 days to secure the next home. And a lot of buyers today may cooperate because they're anxious about actually getting a property. Yeah, I agree. I mean, some buyers, I know a lot of the buyers that I'm working with, they would be receptive to that because yeah. of their renting. If yeah. They're flexible. They're like, whatever the seller wants. Um, it's not always the case, though. Right. I mean, I think it's something that as a buyer, if you do have the flexibility and you can um, accommodate that, it's a way to strengthen your offer without having to pay more money or give up uh, some of your due diligences. Um, so if you're able to do that, that's a good option. I would probably um, go more for a rent back. Right. So that at least you're closer to a settlement date. Right. Than just having it open ended, you know, with a the seller finding suitable housing could be very right. open ended in the buyers, yeah. you know. And I think I would want I would definitely want this like a certain date by which it mm -hmm. will settle regardless of if suitable housing is found. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, and I think it's, if you're willing to work with the seller, they might be willing to work with you. It depends on what you want the house. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's the house you want, sometimes people are I mean, you talked about the I was immediately when you talked about new construction, I thought of the folks you talked about. Yeah. 4 to 13 months is a pretty <laughs> Talk about nine nine months. It's a, wow. And a, they sold their house and then we're having to like, oh live with family. But they also wanted new construction. Yep. They wanted a new one. Like it was it was worth it for them because they were going to yeah. be there a long and time. And I mean, yes. And at the end, they, they were happy with their decision. But I'm sure there were months in there that they were <laughs> like. Ready to like, kill each other. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right. All right. Here, here's where it gets interesting. Convert the previous home into a rental. You mean this is to avoid having a home sale contingency? No, no. So you can handle the lease yourself or refer to, see, I think this is, this doesn't make any sense. The home set stays an asset for your client. 
and they can keep their low interest rate and they can also buy a new home. Uh, well, if they're in a position financially, yeah, that they're able to do that. Yeah. I don't think this solves the problem if right. I have nowhere to go, though. I mean, it, right. it's, it, it, I, I don't really understand this one. So you're in agreement there. Not, not a good option. Yeah. All right. Here's the next one. Leasing back the home. Uh, for a seller? It's, yes. it's definitely, I, I mean, I've done it numerous mm -hmm. times. And it's the only option sometimes for sellers. Mm -hmm. You have to get their home on the market first. Get it sold because they yes. need the proceeds. Right. And then, but that's all up front, spelled out. It's negotiated, Yeah, you know, however long it could be, 30, 60, 90 days. I think the longest I had was a 90 day because mm -hmm. uh, we were kind of nervous that, you know, trying to find something and, and where she wanted to be in her price point mm -hmm. was going to be a difficult proposition. We got super lucky. I swear when things go start to go in motion, mm -hmm. it can work out and yeah. things happen and open up. And, uh, the house came, her dream house came on the market. She threw in a great offer and she got it. So she, the yes. her lease back ended early. The buyers were super happy because it got them out of their living situation sooner. Uh, so everybody was happy. So lease back, I, I yes. agree. I think you really have to look at this option, especially if you, you're you not sure where you're going to go mm -hmm. because some sellers, they need to get their home sold before they can actually go buy something. So I, I agree with that one. All right. The rest of these, I just, we're going to, I want you to just, I'm going to group them all together and we'll call it here. Buying an RV, a houseboat or a sailboat, find your would-be seller an off-market home to purchase where that seller has flexibility. I agree with that one. I think if, if you're willing to put that time in, then they have move into an assisted living care facility and move in with relatives. What do you think about these options? Wow. Okay. Well, I mean, it, it has to be right for the seller. Right. Right. They're moving into like an assisted living. That's because they're, you know, they're at a point in their life where right. that's what makes the most sense for them. Right. Um, moving into an RV. I had a client do that. <laughs> really? Yeah. They lived in the RV for about six months. And um, yeah. So it was funny. They sold the house. They went into temporary housing for a couple of weeks, but when they closed and they had their proceeds, they bought the RV. Oh, that's fine. Yeah. Uh huh. And went way I mean, I guess around. that's something that you would be using then later anyway, if that's kind of like, if you wanted to kind of like travel, like that would mm -hmm. potentially solve that problem for. But they didn't know where they were going to land. Yeah. They didn't know where they were going to end up. And yeah, they just went out there and it was during COVID anyway. So yeah. Yeah. They had a great <laughs> experience in their RV. Yeah. They finally found their place where they landed. They eventually sold the RV. Yeah. And got into their new home in yeah. their new, new state. So interesting. Wait, was the one of the other options we were talking about sailboat or houseboat? Was that buy or rent? Buy. Those are well, probably yeah. crazy. It's, you, it, very I crazy. Mean, the, the, to boats are skills. a lot of people say that the, the happiest and saddest day when you buy the boat is the day the happiest day is the day you sell it, and then the saddest day is the day you buy it and realize, realize how much maintenance yeah, is there. I mean yeah. I, I, you know, I don't, so, you know, I think the whole point of this is that there, there are options out there and if someone's really motivated, they're going to look at the options. If they're not, well, it just might be where it is. So that's the latest market update. Let's take a quick break. We're going to come back. We're going to talk about a bright MLS change that is not shocking, but indicative of what we talked about last week with the MLS pin decision. Then we're going to jump into FBO services, Inc. You can uh, visit them at FBO services, Inc.com. We've got Evan Roscoe's here. So that's it for, uh, right now. We'll be back in one minute for, with uh, Tool Time Real Estate Radio on WWDB 860 AM. What the mortgage the service and great rates on your money? Look no further than the bright said you can put zero in as a co-op. It's a fucking difference in area for 40 years with a focus on well, smooth, easy access to the MLS pin decision from last year. They have the settlement. Upsizing or downsizing. Like the class action lawsuits and stuff. Financing. We have programs for you. We also have closing cost assistance programs and you access traffic, to subsidized sir. interest rates. Yeah, I hit some traffic. It's free. Um, no cost or commitment. My last name is like Visit our website at mymortgageamerican.com. That's good happens.
received uh, $165 million dollars of volume in to Tool Time Real Estate Radio on WWDB 860 AM. I'm Tom Tool. She's Sarah Time and she's Stacy Mitchell. And we have Evan Roscoe's here from FBO Services, Inc., a local family investing office based out of Wayne. You can visit them at fboservicesinc.com. Stacy, Sarah, and I all work at the Tom Tool Sales Group at REMAX Mainline, the number one REMAX team in Pennsylvania since 2018, number 11 in the country, number seven in the state. And we're streaming live every week on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram. Just look up Tom Tool Sales Group. So we're not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I do want to hear your reaction. It's a little bit of a follow-up from last week, ladies. And Evan, feel free to chime in. I know this is your field of expertise, obviously, as a real estate sales. So Bright MLS, our local MLS. So they cover Pennsylvania, Jersey, Maryland, uh, D.C., Virginia. It's, it's the second largest MLS in the country. Starting August 9th, they are making a small change to underscore the complete flexibility of Bright subscribers to engage in transparent negotiations with their clients and no longer requiring an offer of compensation to be in the MLS. Now, you could put a dollar in there and then it would go to zero. So I don't, I don't, I don't see much of a difference with the offer of compensation because a dollar, I mean, that, that doesn't do much for anybody. I, mean, I don't even know what you can get for a dollar these days, maybe like a soft pretzel or something. What do you think about this? Because there's a lot more ramifications, in my view, than just they can. you can now uh, submit a listing without a buyer broker compensation offer. You look distraught, Stacey. <laughs> well, I'm wondering, <laughs> yeah, because it's, it's kind of confusing. So, yeah, there is no difference really between the zero and the dollar, but... I'm wondering if the seller, it like, do they fully understand how if you're offering zero compensation? Because this is all agreed upon by, by the seller. This right. is the seller's wishes. It's going to be harder for the buyer's agents to bring buyers to the home unless the buyer's agents are great at expressing their value mm -hmm. to their clients. Right. Well, and I guess looking you know if it is going to be all across the board for what you know some offer some don't you know yada yada i know like typically i'm not looking at what commission i'm getting before i take somebody out like if they like a house i look at you know i'm reading the information about the house i'm looking at the seller's disclosure i'm looking at the sales history i'm not like looking at like in order to determine if i'm going to take them or not like well what's the percentage of the commission split that would go to me you know mm -hmm. it's like because you assume it's kind of what it, there's a range, but like you just kind of assume it's in there. Um, sometimes for new construction, I will look. <laughs> I can, they can be sneaky. Um, but uh, yes, it would also be unfortunate if you got your buyer out there, they really liked it. And then as you're further into like them being interested and maybe wanting to put in an offer, then realizing, okay, now we have to cover this as well, you know? Mm -hmm. Right. You have to make that, have that discussion. Right. About compensation. Um, but yet, Sarah, I, I'm like you, I don't look for that. Yeah. That's not the, the, 
I dive right into the showing schedule first to see, okay, how busy is it? Right. I get my clients in the time they want to see it. Right. And then you book it and then you go in and then you you want to like secure your time slot and then you want to like go in and like read all the things and get them the information. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a lot of times I'm not even really looking at that split until like sometimes like after you put the offer, right. you know, because they're like, under contract and then you right. And then when you fill out your little yes, like yes. sheet in dot leaf, then you're like, oh, I guess I should see what those are. Right. <laughs> Well, I, I agree. You guys are because you put clients first, right? I mean, mm-hmm. obviously, I, I had a major hand in training both of you. I mean, we, we work together a, a lot, and that's how you should be proceeding. And that that's always going to be the case. And the, the, the challenge here is that not enough agents even attempt to communicate value. They just want to go start showing people properties. Um, and they, they just want to get them out there. And they default to, hey, if I'm the one that brings them the right house, then I'm going to be the one that makes the commission instead of educating consumers, talking to them about how the process works. And it's not just one process. It's the buying process, the purchase process, the lending process, what's going on in the market and what actually the buyer wants to accomplish with the home purchase, what their goals are. And so many folks don't, don't even, they don't even consider this. They just want to get them out and they start showing homes. And it's like, it's, it, I, I, I liken this to dating where you meet somebody and you want to go out on like the third date and like take them home to meet your parents instead of, hey, let's get to know each other and see if there's actually a connection here. And that's the step most salespeople don't know how to do. They have commission breath and it, it's a problem. Um, this is also related, obviously, to these lawsuits. So we have these these uh, class action lawsuits, um, the Merle and the Sitzer Burnett case about the home seller plaintiffs that um, and, and they're slated to go to trial in October. This is coming up. Now, let's see if it gets delayed or, 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 or whatnot. And Bright is one of 20 MLSs named as a co-conspirator in the case. NAR, the National Association of Realtors, has come out and said they support the decision that Bright made. I think this is going to be a, like a change that happens across the board. That's just my guess. Uh, and, I, you know, the thing I, I don't get is that on the other side of this, and I want to hear your reaction. And, you know, Evan, you've been on the transaction side here, so feel free to, to, to chime in what's going to happen to these buyers that don't know what's going on. And now because of the lack of compensation, they're going to be forced to deal with listing agents or to your point, agents won't, Hey, I'm not showing you that house. I'm not making any money off of it, which there's ways around by the way. And you can negotiate that. It's there. There's PAR documents that allow for it. What do you think happens to those folks? Because a VA buyers in a lot of trouble here. They can't even, if they have to pay any fees, they're not allowed to. So VA, VA's banned that. Or some of these folks, they get into these homes, literally, they have like $10 left over. I mean, mm-hmm. they're putting all their money to get into the house. So for the folks that don't understand that or financially can't, and now they're forced to pay a, a fee, I think those are the people that are going to be damaged the most. And it might cost the sellers money if people aren't bringing all the buyers through. Because you're doing things the right way doesn't mean everyone does. I mean, that, that's just the reality. So what does everyone think here? I think the buyers definitely get hurt. Oh, yeah, because first of all, if they if they're forced to deal with the listing agent, the listing agent is, you know, working 100 percent for the seller. Right. So then you have if there's dual agency, I don't know, there's I don't think that ever really goes too smoothly. I don't like to be in that situation. Mm -hmm. Right. Personally, um, because it's it's all about perception. Somebody could perceive something. uh, Mm -hmm. So it, you know, could create issues. But the buyer and the, the whole reason why it is the way it is now is because buyers were getting hurt mm. because the buyers were the ones either have to hire an attorney and you know how that goes half the time. Right. Or they had to deal with listing agents and it didn't go smoothly. Right. Well, and I mean, it's as you get to know your your clients and you've put in offers, you generally know like what their comfort level is for how risky they're willing to go in order to get the deal right so if you know that they are definitely going to want inspections or if you even if you like put in language there for like parameters to kind of strengthen things or or word things a little bit more favorably for the seller like you might know like they in 99 percent of the cases are going to want inspections well if they are dealing just with the listing agent and the listing agent's the one drawing up the paperwork and like whether or not they say that they're doing it this way or not, they might, the buyer might not know what to look for in that contract and what is covered and what isn't. So maybe they get under contract. Maybe they put down their deposit. Then they realize that they don't have these different due diligences in place. They're not comfortable moving forward and then they lose their deposit money. Well, 
now maybe they have to wait another year to resave up or to, you know what I mean? Maybe that might've been their one shot at getting something. So. And I mean, it sounds to me just like as somebody that doesn't understand all of exactly that. Sure. It makes it more difficult for clients or consumers to really know what's going on and more opportunity for your, I guess, you know, your profession to have a bad rap because people mm -hmm. aren't going to know what's going on. Yeah. There's going to yeah. be more stories of like, ah, well, this person did this and this, blah. so I don't know. That'd be my concern. And then maybe just a lot more of a having to walk through your clients with how everything works is always mm -hmm. more difficult and time consuming. I, I do see an opportunity here for people that really want to help help folks. I mean, that's why I got into the business. Um, you know, when, when Evan and I were in business school together at Syracuse and it was like, I, I decided I like, there's a need here for the market where there's so many bad agents out there. So maybe you'll see some people leave or it, it, it levels up the professionalism. So I think that's how the, hopefully the industry does react. I just don't know what's going to happen here. So th this is the first of a couple things that are going to start to come down. I'm clear this could end up anywhere with a small change to the contract to buyer agency being obliterated. I mean, it could go any way with these class action lawsuits and we'll see what happens. I mean, you got companies like Remax, uh, Keller Williams, Anywhere, Home Services, they're all named in this suit. And I don't think they're gonna settle like MLS Pin did up in Massachusetts. So stay tuned on this one. We've been talking about this a while. So we're gonna take a quick break. We're gonna come back. We're gonna talk with Evan Roscoe's from FBO Services. You can visit their website, FBO Services Inc. Talk all about family offices and how they benefit folks and help people. This is Tool Time Real Estate Radio on WWDB 860 AM. The red tape when getting your mortgage from a big or big radio bank. debut. In Mortgage America, we have access to big bank money, but with the personalized and you detailed like service. I'm excited already being on the show. We are here in your community and ready to serve with fast sellers. Remember the first show we did? Like, I was nervous as hell. We had to come here on that Sunday. Pre approval is oh, free. Do no costs or commitments. I think For it's like two years now. How old is Maddie? At mymortgeamerica.com. Right before you had her. 610 439 Yeah, it was right. Yeah, so that's about yeah, a little over two years. If you're getting a mortgage, you shouldn't have to sacrifice great service just to get a great rate. And Mortgage America, we've been lending on this philosophy for 35 years. We've actually had a great rate. I mean, we do like social stuff in the stream. And I'm like, that's where it's actually like it's easier. So, yeah, I mean, this is like, it's like easier to get people to come here. It's like easier to get people to come here. specialize in all residential mortgage programs, including first time buyers. I think Garrett's done all down payment options. For your back of three approvals, call us at 610 439 8000 or fly online at mymortgageamerica.com. The Town Tool Sales Group is the number one Remax team in Pennsylvania with yeah, okay, over $165 million in volume for 2021. I'm Tom Tool, and our team has achieved that kind of success by being a great place to work with and to work for. No one knows greater Philly better than this. We know real estate, but more importantly, we're real people. Yeah. So we hire the best kind of, agents and we give them all the tools to succeed. Even our brand new agents sell 17 to 24 homes a year because our team delivers the best experience in real estate. Teams deliver a better experience than individuals, and we're a top 1% real estate team in the country. We call it AAA service. We're your advocate, ally, and advisor. Because this isn't a transaction to us. It's a relationship. If you're buying or selling a home, call the Tom yeah, Tool so Sales Group at Remax Main Line at 610-696-6976 or visit TomTool.com. That's TomTool with an E dot com. Sell your home. Wait a second. Remember the real estate golden rule. You always get more when you work with Tom Tool. Have you considered a career in real estate? Do you want control over your income? What? Ten seconds or not, call us today at 610 692 6976 or visit tomtool.com. Join our team, the Tom Tool Sales Tip Ups Main Line. All right, all right, all right. We are back on Tool Time Real Estate Radio on WWDB 860 AM. I'm Tom Tool. She's Stacey Mitchell. She's Sarah Timon. We've got special guest in the house, Evan Roscos from FBO Services. You can visit their website, fboservicesinc.com. They're a local family office. So Evan, just, just tell us about the company and we'll, and we'll start there. So, uh, you know, the company was started by my father probably in 2003. Um, he's been in family office for all of his career. Um, kind of the history is that he started with um, working for, you know, accounting firm that worked for, you know, the Pew family and did all of their family stuff. Wow. He went and worked for the family and then you know, kind of the main people that were, you know, funding it all, the patriarch, matriarch, passed away. So they kind of converted into a multifamily office and started serving all the individual family members individually. So doing their tax and accounting. Love it. So 
What is a family office for people that don't know? Because I, I, I hear this term thrown around all the time. I don't think a lot of people actually know what it means. Similar to real estate. People don't know until they know. Sure. So I'll go through kind of the history of it. I have a little cheat sheet here. So, you know, really, if we go way back in time, the first time we kind of look at it is basically, you know, the, you know, the king's exchequer, who was basically the financial manager and accountant for the king. Mm -hmm. And so then, you know, the next evolution really was, you know, the gilded age when we had the robber barons who had this wealth in homes. You know, you had these cottages in Newport, Rhode Island. And, you know, they had so much wealth, you know, even the European, you know, couldn't believe the commoners would have this much wealth. Um, and this continued in the 19th and 20th centuries. These families had all this personal operations for their personal empires. Um, so primarily family office handled most things on the expense side because they had huge living expenses and they need somebody to basically take care of all this in a similar fun fashion that, you know, a business would take care of everything. It's kind of the accounts for the family. So this is kind of one of the things like, on the evolution where these old, old families had all this money that was coming off, you know, coal, steel, railroads. So their accounting departments were, or their family office was mostly expense, you know, paying for all of their lifestyle. Um, so we'll come to that somehow how that's changed currently at the end. Um, but just moving through that, you know, the Gilded Age ended, the World War One, Two, One, the Depression, and they kind of disappeared in the, in the 80s. Although there were some that still were around to handle, you know, this vast wealth, but they just weren't as prevalent. And, you know, they had to keep track of all this, you know, wealth, but there just weren't as many, which then changed a lot in the 1990s when concentrated started to get, you know, wealth got concentrated again. We saw more and more mm -hmm. very, very wealthy individuals. And instead of having these big companies that kicked off a lot of cash, now we have a lot of, you know, individuals that have sold their, their company. And so we have a lot of liquidity events. So. A lot of family offices we see are being driven by these liquidity events. So if somebody has a big has starts a company, they sell it for a couple hundred million dollars. Now they need somebody to take care of all this money they made. So that's kind of where we are today, where we still have the expense side, which is what we mostly do: expense, tax, accounting, reporting. But there's also this investment management side, which is you know investing the assets in private equity. So our company, you know, we're primarily accountants, so we do mostly the accounting and tax for you know these individuals. I mean, I'd imagine these are pretty complicated tax returns to do. It's not like your your typical W two or even like a, like a ten ninety nine person like we all are. So I mean, it's I, I it sounds like it's it's a big endeavor, especially when you're dealing with that much wealth and, and the tax obligations got to be huge for some of these folks. And, and it really is, and a lot of it's with the, the you know the entities. So we're seeing a lot of entities, mm -hmm. people have real estate investments, and you know especially with real estate, you know they create LLCs all the time. So there's a lot of that back and forth, and then. You know the the money the moving the money around so one llc wants to buy a new property they need some money they have to get from all the other ones so there's a lot of moving parts that all ends up on their individual return but there's all these you know entities and trust behind it well and that's how you protect yourself it's like i mean that because that, there, there's so much risk involved when you have that much money and you become a target let's face it i mean that's that's what happens to a lot of these folks sure absolutely and so a lot of it is you know doing their estate plan and you know liability as well as you know tax planning you know, for multiple generations. So there's a lot of moving parts. You know, we kind of say it's, you know, it's kind of like running your own household, but if your household was very, very, very complicated. So, you know, it's, <laughs> it's, it, get, it gets complicated with, you know, size and scale. Love it. So again, you can visit their website. It's fboservicesinc.com. So you went through the history of family office, which I love. Who's your ideal client right now? If someone's listening and maybe they find themselves in this situation or who are you looking to, to, to bring on board and help them manage their finances so you can protect them from all the risks and liabilities that are out there? Right. So generally, we like to think that, you know, there's multifamily offices, which is a firm like ours that serves multi -fam multiple families. Mm -hmm. And there's single family offices, which do just, you know, one family. So, you know, I'd like to say, you know, you have 50, 50 million is probably where it starts to make sense, you know, 100 million. And then if you get up to like 200, 250 million, that's when you probably start to think about your own family office and hiring your own people. Now, we would help you get up and running, set it up. But it gets to the point where you don't want to outsource everything because you're big enough to do it all yourself. So I'd say probably when you start to have, you know, a lot of heartache and headaches about, you know, there's too many different entities and the tax returns and getting all the stuff together mm -hmm. and even paying your own bills, you know, you're sick of doing it. You have multiple houses, you know, that's where you can, you know, hire us and basically we'll change the address and have all the bills come to us and pay everything and put it all together for you nice and easy. You don't have to waste your time on it. Oh, that's nice. Wow. First Everything of all, goes to you and you, you guys just take care of all of it. Yep. So if you, <laughs> you have to have the money to do it. <laughs> well, I've learned something. I, I didn't know there was such thing as a family office. Yeah. And what it, and what it was. Right. 
and the history of that is fascinating to me. So thanks for sharing the history of, of that. So, but yeah, to, to think that there is a need for services like this is even more fascinating. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So do you, would like a source where you get different clients from, are there accountants that deal with um, maybe these individuals prior to them? Like, you know, you said you're like the cap for where it makes sense for your firm might be like the 200 million or whatever. And then after that, they might want to like do their own. Are there companies that would be, you know, our cap is at up to 50 million and then it makes sense to, for you to like switch into something like your company and then they kind of hand them off to you as like a little chain? Sure. So, I mean, a lot of it, I think is, you know, certain accounting firms, they aren't really set up to kind of do what we do. So mm -hmm. a lot of the kind of personal, like day-to-day -day administrative and, yeah. you know, the touching base with clients, you know, every day or, you know, every week at least. So a lot of times when clients start to see need more and more service mm -hmm. is kind of where it makes sense for us to bring in versus, you know, accounting firm is just kind of really just focus on tax returns. Yeah. Um, so I think that's probably the main area where it changes. Do you find many people trying to like hide money in shell companies? No, I think I don't think there's a lot of hiding. I think there's a lot of. Uh, I think it's probably impossible to hide things anymore. I mean, it's, yeah. it, it, it's got to be way harder, right? Yeah, I mean, I think it's hard. Well, with all the different rules there are, yeah, it's hard. But I think more so just when we get a new client, just understanding where everything is because there yeah. tends to be so many different entangled entities that people don't even really understand or know exactly how it's going. Yeah. So there's a lot of that. I guess the other thing that we do, we do do a lot of, especially when, you know, interest rates were so low as far as real estate is, you know, when these wealthy families want to buy a house or buy a property, you know, we do a lot with the um, mortgage underwriting because they want all sorts of information. They want the K1. So a lot of times that's a big endeavor, endeavor, you know, especially the refinance as well to provide everything that the bankers want, which seems to be, you know, ridiculous these days. Yeah. Th that's a really great point. I mean, I, I've been through this uh, with clients and, and when you have like an LLC and you have some investment properties and then the bank thinks there's like a higher risk profile. So that that's that's a really great observation because I, there's a lot of folks that try to do all the stuff on their own and it, it, it does become tough to manage. I mean, it, so it's I mean, that that, that that's super important. Um, I, I'm on your website here. Talk to me about the Goldilocks reports. I think this is a great thing to provide because people want to know what's going on, but they don't need to know everything. That's why they're hiring you guys. Sure. So like a lot of times we'll have clients, they'll have a lot of different trusts and different LLCs and broker statements. And, you know, they have, let's say four or five houses and, you know, kind of the Goldilocks reports is, you know, it's not too much. So it's not basically everything, you know, hundreds of pages or, you know, 20 or 30 pages, but you know, it's not just a couple of things. So we kind of put it on one page, the cash flow, basically here's where your money's coming from. Here's where it's going. Here's where the other sources uses it. Give them just reports that, are digestible and understandable so they can look at it, you know, one kind of one page. So that's the idea of the goalie box, not, not too much, not too little, just the right amount. Yeah. Oh, that's great. I, I think that's, that's huge because I mean, just as a business owner, you probably have go through the same thing with your own business. There's certain like numbers and KPIs. You want to make sure where they're trending and, and, and all that. And when you've got $50 million or more and you don't know what the heck is going on, that's how you see the hear these stories of like people they just lose their money because their their buddy's taking care of it and you know, I mean it, it's I mean it, you're laughing but this no, is this is real true. life it's so true, yeah. it happens to athletes all the time yeah, all the time it very much does yeah and it's scary because I mean there's I think it's easy to let these things get away from you and not know what's happening and to think that you're fine but you're not so I think it's you know and that's where we are you know we're accountants so you know CPAs and we like double entry so we're very much into reconciling all the bank accounts and making sure everything's there um, and not just being you know. Kind of, I feel like some people are uh, more fly by their seat, you know, not as disciplined. Makes me nervous just even talking about this. I know. With that kind of money involved. There's a huge trust factor. How do you build that trust with clients? I think it's just something that comes over time. So, I mean, you know, after we, you know, work with them for a little bit and show them everything, you know, a, a trust does develop. And a really, you know, a lot of it comes down to, you know, kind of, you know, our people who kind of do most of the work, do all, all the work, actually. So they develop great relationships with the clients and, and touch base with them so often. So I think that. It's one of those things just over time, you know, the more and more we do, you know, we can help them, you know, save their time and, and be comfortable with what's going on. Wow. So what's, what's like the stress test? Do you ever put like people through this to like determine if they really need this kind of service or not? Like, I mean, is there, is there a, like if someone's feeling a certain way and obviously, you know, step one is having some money in the bank, right? Like Sarah said, like, I mean, this sounds amazing for, I, I would love this. I mean, I think it's fantastic. Like not having to worry about all this stuff. What, what are some of the characteristics of, folks that you see or, or, or companies or families that you help where this is happening for them 
and and like there's like a, there's like a criteria like you, like they have the same the similar set of problems right because you're solving a problem here so i mean the one thing that we see a lot is you know liquidity events a lot of times we'll have these these companies and you know their controller is it's doing all of this stuff with them so now they sell their company and the controller goes with the company so you need somebody to do all this stuff that they were doing so that's really the one thing we see a lot of um i guess the other would be you know uh, we also see this sometimes when there's a death and you know somebody you know there's a widower who had you know and the husband had all sorts of stuff going on and they didn't really know and now they're what do they do that's kind of another situation within just more broadly i guess any time where like there's a, a lot of stuff going on there's a lot of assets a lot of different you know houses and trusts and there's one person doing it and they just feel overwhelmed that's probably kind of where it makes sense to have us come in and take a look and get everything sorted out that's amazing that, that, there's a lot of fun, especially you look at like the era we live in today, like everyone's kind of got this like side businesses going on or they have this home's in a trust, but I've got an investment LLC that handles these rental properties. And it, it does get complicated if you don't have someone handling that. And it's, you know, a lot of times these people don't have any professional training. They're just kind of somebody told them to do something or their financial sure. advisor said something or their accountant did. So, uh, so again, it's FBO services, Inc.com. If you want to get in touch with Evan and his company, so anything else we should know about family offices? I mean, I think you have a great history. I've I, I got a very clear understanding of how you can help folks here. What are, what, what's someone who maybe if they, like that, that people like they don't know about family offices that might be able to benefit them? I guess the one thing to know is that they are becoming more and more prevalent. So, I mean, in the, you know, the investing in the financial world, you're hearing more and more about family offices, you know, as real estate professionals, you probably are bumping into people that have family offices or who are buying something. They say, go to my family office. So, I guess really just to, to know that, you know, it's, it's kind of a new moniker for, you know, very wealthy individuals that are having, you know, professionals either outsourced or that they hire themselves, you know, take care of all of their, their finances and their wealth, if you will. Love it. Very, very helpful. So it's fboservicesinc.com. So we got a couple minutes left here, ladies. What do you got for Evan? Do, I guess for most, in most cases here, you start with them and then basically unless that their wealth caps out over where it makes sense to still be with you, they're generally either like a client for life or until hopefully not the case, but if they lose their wealth. <laughs> sure. Exactly. Yeah. So usually they're, they're clients for, for a very long, long time until, you know, there's some other event. Yeah. Um, and you know, if it doesn't make sense, a lot of times we've seen where, you know, either they don't have enough wealth or they have too much, then we'll kind of work with them to figure out how to simplify it or yeah. how to move forward and hire some of their own people. Cause you know, it doesn't make sense for us to do it when, they should just hire somebody. Sure. Well said. So again, you can get in touch with Evan's company. It's fboservicesinc.com. Thanks for coming on, my friend. Really appreciate you. If you want to follow yeah. Sarah, she's on Instagram. It's at Ty underscore Ty Time. You can follow Stacy at the number two Mitchco. You can follow me at Tom Tool 3 rd on Instagram. We're streaming live every single week. Facebook, YouTube, Instagram. Just look up Tom Tool Sales Group. Make sure to follow and like. And if there's any, uh, we'll be back next week on Tool Time Real Estate Radio on WWDB. 860 a.m. Cool. Good job, man. Now I'm going to listen for the buzzword. Family office. Oh, okay. I got it. Family office. I mean, you're working with a client that can afford the house. Right. Exactly. 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 We'll it does get crazy though. Like I mean, even like, like some people don't know anything is going on. Like we, we see the other side of it. They're like, I haven't filed my taxes in two years. And I'm like, oh yeah, it's all the time. They're like, we'll be behind our taxes or we have like clients who like like figure everything out. I'm like, it's not have that much. Like they think they do. Oh my gosh. Yeah. You're like, oh, you're like. That would be a bust. Yeah. They're like pulling money from all over the place.